my main uh, message this morning will just be to quickly introduce the topic and the speakers, and then they will, um, of course, go through their presentations. And then, uh, well, I'll have a schedule in, in one of the next slides. So let me try to change slides and, and, and yeah, hope this works, it does. All right, so today's topic is basically populations, and specifically when we talk about compact binaries. So the idea here is pretty straightforward. As we all know, as of a few days ago, the ground-based detectors have uh, reported of the 90, maybe, compact binary coalescences. So the idea is that, you know, as we build up a, a large set of sources, we can try not only to characterize each of them individually, but also go after the properties of the underlying astrophysical population or populations that these sources are uh, represent representing. And so the goal ultimately is to answer questions which pertain to the astrophysics of uh, compact binaries. For example, do all of the binary black holes that we have detected so far or that we can detect in the near future come from the same formation channels, astrophysical formation channels, or do we need to think about multiple formation channels to explain the data? Regardless of how many or the, of, of how many such formation channels there exist, how well can we characterize them? Can we, for example, um, measure the efficiency of astrophysical parameters such as common envelope uh, efficiency for binaries that form in galactic fields or fallback fraction uh, you know, when the star goes supernovae or the kicks during supernovae explosion. So these are the kind of astrophysical questions about the formation of binaries and their progenitor stars that we can try to address with the population of binaries. If more than one channels exist, which seems to be likely the case, we can try to uh, you know, measure the branching ratio. So how, each of this, how much each of these channels is efficient at producing compact binaries that are detectable. And hence, what is the merger rate in each of these channels? So that is basically the idea. That's what typically is meant by, you know, when we say we want to do inference on the population of binaries. Now, the idea is that by the end of today's, you know, uh, talks and discussion, we should be able to, for example, understand plots like this one that come from the latest LIGO Virgo uh, population paper that was released a few days ago. In this plot, for example, we are showing on the x-axis the mass of the primary, meaning the most massive object in the binary, in solar mass, masses, and on the y-axis, the merger rate per unit mass. And this, for example, shows that there is a, a rather clear evidence for a peak at around 35 solar masses you know, and a few other features which may be slightly less solid. So today we're really going to talk about end-to-end uh, -end, uh, how you would go along to produce and interpret a plot like this pretty much. And I'll stop here so I don't spoil any, any of the uh, talks. Right, so uh, what is uh, required to perform this type of analysis is a, uh, is a so-called hierarchical Bayesian analysis, which uh, uh, the word kind of gives away the meaning the reason why it's hierarchical is because more than one level of inference is required. Typically, we first need at a lower level to characterize the parameters of each of the compact binaries, for example, black holes, say that you know, they are uh, characterized by their masses, speeds, sky positions, distance, and so on and so forth. We can call this uh, vector theta. And uh, we're not going to talk about this lower level today. This is going to be the topic of, uh, of Fridays, uh, or, uh, Friday's day, how well that can be done, what type of systematics exist, and so on and so forth. The next level, once you have an idea of the parameters of each of your sources individually, is to use all of the sources cumulatively, or sorry, together rather, I should say, jointly, to infer the underlying distribution that these theta vectors are drawn from. All right, so what is needed to perform this type of analysis at a very high level is the following. We need first one or more algorithms that provide a list of triggers above some 
detection statistic threshold, which can be a false alarm ratio, a signal to noise ratio, or something like that. So basically, we need a list of events above some uh, statistics. And of course, I'm making this very simple. This whole, this single bullet could have its own pretty much workshop. And then once you have that, you need a model for the hyperparameters, so pretty much the population parameters. For example, um, you know, if you may assume, we may assume that the mass function of the cause, it's a power law. And in that case, that's the model. The parameters may be the slope of this power law, the minimum and the maximum value of the range, where you can take values and so on and so forth. We could assume that the spin distribution of black hole is a Gaussian. In that case, our model, it's a Gaussian and the other parameters will be something like the mean and the standard deviation. So this is the kind of uh, one of the required ingredients with the model for the population. Now, why is this actually very challenging in spite of my, you know, every, all the to-dos fitting in one of my slides? Because, there are many, very many reasons why this, in fact, is not trivial. And that's going to be the topic of our fourth uh, presentation today. So one of them, one of the reasons why it's not that simple is that not all of the sources are equally easy to detect. For example, easy, uh, heavy compact binaries, for example, heavy binary black holes, are easier to detect than lighter ones. So that means that typically we have to deal with selection effects that have to be carefully folded in your analysis to avoid uh, you know, uh, systematic biases. Then we are facing with significant computational challenges for various reasons. First, we need to generate posterior samples for the distribution, the posterior distribution of individual events. And this needs to be done carefully. We need to have enough samples that the tails of the distributions or weird features are fully resolved, or we need some smarter approach. Then once you do this for all of your significant events or the events that pass your uh, selection uh, criteria, you have to combine them together to calculate an overall likelihood. And uh, as you can imagine, and uh, we are going to talk about this in our presentations, the type of uh, computational challenge and requirement increase with the number of sources that you want to use for your inference. Then, um, of course, our detectors are good at producing triggers, which are not astrophysical in origin, but are basically what we call the grounds. And those can contaminate the inference if they're not properly accounted for. And then, uh, last but least but not last, we have the astrophysical models, which, as I said, are one of the main required ingredients, must be complicated and complex enough to capture the astrophysics so that we can actually learn something useful when we use them. So typically, uh, our first speaker was, was not talk about it, typically these models are inspired uh, at some level by either theory and or population synthesis codes. At the same time, the models must still be simple enough that we can calculate them pretty quickly because we need to evaluate them millions of times, right? So these slides really summarize uh, some of the main uh, challenges that we typically face when we want to do this type of inference. And uh, the speakers we have lined up for today really are nicely complementary. We'll be able to cover the various phases of this problem. So we will start with uh, uh, Michaela Matelli. She's going to talk about the astrophysical modeling of compact binaries and why it's hard, what needs to be done, and so on and so forth. Then um, we're going to move toward more of the data analysis part of the problem. So Rachel Gray is going to uh, provide uh, an application of this hierarchical population analysis to the specific problem of measuring cosmological parameters using gravitational waves, which turns out to be a very challenging problem and one where selection effects are really important. Then Maya Fischbach uh, will talk about uh, black hole astrophysics with the gravitational wave catalogs. So she will also cover the latest uh, LIGO, Virgo, Kagra results. And finally, Colm Talbot is going to bring us more 
to the actual practical implementation of the algorithms with uh, a adventures in practical population inference. Throughout these talks and the following QA, the q and I'm gonna try to uh, keep a, a track of any eventual interesting topics or open questions that we may want to go back to uh, for the discussion session, which happens at 3.40 local time. All right, so that's all I got. Because my um, computer doesn't seem to like when I'm in full screen, I'm gonna try to stop the screen share and uh, actually stop the share rather, and uh, move on to our first speaker, who is gonna be Michaela Mapelli. Uh, 